one. Mission to the moon, NASA gives the go-ahead for its latest test flight Artemis will launch next Monday. We are go for launch, which is absolutely outstanding. This day has been a long time coming. A short time ago, NASA announced it's given the go-ahead for the launch of the Artemis mission test flight to take place on Monday next week. It's being heralded as the return of human exploration of the moon. You are watching the Flight Readiness Review Briefing for NASA's Artemis One mission. Liftoff of this first uncrewed flight test is currently targeted for Monday, August 29th at 8.33 a.m. Eastern Time from historic Launch Pad 39B. It is expected that the mission will lead eventually to the first woman and the first person of color setting foot there. It is the Apollo mission for a new generation, as our science editor Rebecca Morell explains. After a 50-year gap, we're heading back to the moon, and it all starts here with the Artemis mission and NASA's huge rocket. It's called the Space Launch System, or SLS for short, and it's the most powerful rocket ever built by the US Space Agency. It stands nearly 100 metres, about 320 feet tall, roughly the same height as a 32-storey building. Its colossal size means it's really heavy, so it needs lots of power. It has four engines, but even those aren't enough to get this rocket off the ground. So what it also needs are these two huge boosters. They all use fuel, and the biggest part, called the core stage, is full of fuel. In fact, fuel makes up 90% of the weight of this entire rocket. Now, you might be wondering where the astronauts will go. Well, it's here, near the top, in the Orion crew capsule. But not this time. This is a test flight, so there are no people on board. The time has come to put the space launch system to the test. As it readies for blast-off from Cape Canaveral in Florida on launch pad 39B, the same one used for Apollo, it will be nerve-wracking. Three, two, one. The rocket thunders away from the Earth, eventually reaching speeds of nearly 25,000 miles or 40,000 kilometres an hour. As each component of the rocket completes their job, they separate. The Orion spacecraft is on its way. There's a long journey ahead. It's 380,000 kilometres, about 240,000 miles to the moon. After its launch, the spacecraft enters into a low Earth orbit. Then, with a go from mission control, the engines ignite, giving it the big push it needs to escape our planet's gravity. It takes several days to reach the moon, with the spacecraft making small adjustments along the way. At first, the spacecraft flies in close, 100 kilometres, that's 62 miles above the lunar surface. Then it enters a much larger orbit, swinging more than 65,000 kilometres, about 40,000 miles beyond the moon. That's further than any spacecraft built for humans has ever flown. During the several weeks Orion is in orbit, NASA will collect important data and check how the spacecraft is performing. Finally, after another close flyby, it's ready to head for home. Now, things get hazardous. As the spacecraft nears Earth, it has to enter our atmosphere at exactly the right angle. If it gets this wrong, it will burn up. So, its huge heat shield protects it while the temperature rises to nearly 3,000 degrees Celsius. A series of parachutes open, massively slowing it down, before splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. Well, Keith Cowing is a former NASA employee and now editor of the website NASA Watch. He explained why there was so much excitement surrounding NASA's Art Artemis launch. Well, you know, I am a child of the Apollo generation. I'm 67. I went through all this as a kid. We were told that we were going to land on the moon in uh, nine years, and we did. And so there was a lot of excitement then, but that was then, and this is now. We're talking about the Artemis generation. Uh, and, you know, in, in many ways, a lot of people hearkening back to this being, the, uh, you know, their Apollo moment. But, you know, right now, more than half the world's population 
has never seen anybody walk on another world. So it is in many ways going to be their first moonwalk. But that was then with Apollo. And this is now. We do things differently. Everything's instant. Everything's going to be in HD. So, yeah, you got to have the celebrities and stuff like that. And, you know, it's, it's going to be exciting and noisy. But at the end of the day, we're sending, eventually going to be sending humans to walk on another world. And again, hopefully maybe this time it, it'll be a global effort, not two countries competing with each other. Yeah, you talk about a global effort. It has been very much a team effort, hasn't it? A global collaboration of not just NASA, but many other countries as well. Oh, absolutely. The uh, the stage behind the command uh, module, uh, which boosts the capsule around, is made by Europe. Inside are three mannequins, which are instrumented up. One's an American dummy, and the other two are from Europe. And the science that will come back will be brought all together. And then if you look at who is participating in this whole program, Canada, Europe, Japan. So it's not just going to be the first uh, person of color and the first American woman. It's going to be the first person from Canada, from Europe, from UK, from Japan walking on the surface of the moon. So it's a global effort. Lots of lots of landmark events going to happen. Always a danger, of course, when humans are involved. Um, just how nervous will the teams be about that? Well, they haven't done this in a while with a rocket like this. And the last time we sent humans up was quite some time ago uh, on an, a NASA spacecraft. We have been launching them more recently on SpaceX rockets. But yeah, every time people climb into one of those things, there's a lot of nail biting. It, it just goes with the whole thing. You know? um, and the key is the landing site, isn't it? Explain a little bit about why that's so crucial. Well, during Apollo, they went to the easier sites, which were right like the equator of the moon, and they were more interested in the lighting and being able to see it directly and so forth. But this time, uh, when they land, they're going to go to the south pole of the moon uh, for reasons that, A, we've never been there, and B, because of the way the moon orbits uh, around the Earth and the sun lights it up, the poles sometimes stay in perpetual sunshine, and right next to them is almost perpetual darkness. So what you get is a constant power source, but at the same time, there's apparently ice water uh, and other things in the frozen area, so you have possible fuel. So we're going back there now this time, not only to see what's there, but to see what's there that we could use so that we can stay in the moon longer. And, and obviously there's going to be a lot of um, barriers broken, as you said, the first woman um, to, 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 to walk on the moon. But um, uh, from a science perspective, what are you hoping or what do you think um, may come out of this trip? Well, when you go to the poles, and again, like I said, there's a lot of things that are probably frozen in the darkness. We have an idea what's there, but we won't know exactly until we actually go there and scoop it up and look at it. And the fact that we can now go to another world and mine or do what's called in situ resource utilization, where we dig up stuff and learn to live off the land, that's sort of a paradigm shift from bringing everything with you and only what you bring with you. Now we can bring stuff with us to go get stuff that's already there. That makes staying on the moon and exploring it with humans even easier to do, and we'll get to see more of it.